everyone, I'm Cole. I am part of the FTC University Challenge on Team CU Hyperloop from Colorado. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about different methods of ranging, what some of their advantages and disadvantages are, and then I'll tell you which method we're going to be using for the weekend challenge. So here we go. Okay, so there's four main methods that we're going to be talking about in this video. Um, we'll go over a little bit of how that method works, some of its pros and cons, and then um, I'll talk about which one that we're going to choose, as well as sort of show off kind of some initial concept sketches of um, what we're thinking we're going to be putting on. So starting off with the ultrasonic sensor, essentially the way that works is you would have your ultrasonic sensor here, and if this is the, the front of the ultrasonic, Um, if you have an object over here, what the ultrasonic sensor does is it sends out um, high frequency sound waves that travel out of the front of the device, bounce off of any hard surface, and return back into the device where it's um, detected. Um, now the ultrasonic sensor determines how long, uh, how long it took for that sound to travel from the device and bounce off the wall and return. And since we know what the speed of sound in air is, we can calculate what, the, what that distance that it traveled is. So um, ultrasonic sensors can be nice because they're usually relatively inexpensive, um, but some of their drawbacks might be that um, they're usually not very long range. Um, so typically, typical ultrasonic sensors will only work within maybe one to 20 meters um, away. Uh, that works fine for FTC uh, in general, but sometimes if you're less than a meter, um, it's not going to be able to know what that distance is. Uh, so because of that, as well as because uh, we don't currently have any ultrasonic sensors with us, um, we're not going to be using an ultrasonic sensor. Another option is a LIDAR. Uh, so that's an acronym uh, that stands for light imaging, detection, and ranging. So it's super similar to the ultrasonic sensor in that it sends out a beam of light which bounces off an object and returns to the sensor. And there's a couple of different ways that lighters can work, uh, but at the end of the day, you get a distance reading out of it. The nice thing about lidars, they're they're typically a little bit more expensive than ultrasonic sensors, uh, which isn't great, but they're usually about the same size, and they're typically a lot more accurate uh, and can work in a much wider range of distances. So you can have LIDARs which operate in the centimeter or less uh, range, um, and other different uh, LIDAR models that could operate uh, on the ranges of kilometers. So um, CO Hyperloop has a LiDAR system that'll measure over five kilometers uh, with centimeter precision, uh, which is great, and we were hoping to use that. However, unfortunately, it's locked away in one of Hyperloop's lab spaces on campus, uh, which is locked over the weekends. So we are also not going to be using LiDAR, despite that being our uh, preferred choice. When we nice did. job, Cole. Yeah, unfortunately. It was our preferred choice from the brainstorming, but uh, is not going to be what we're going to be using, mostly because we don't have access to our LiDAR system right now. So we went back to the drawing board. That kind of thing happens, right? Uh, we think that one thing's going to work, but unfortunately, um, you know, maybe even non for non-engineering reasons, uh, something doesn't work out. So we looked at some of the sensors that we did have, um, and we noticed that we had a touch sensor. So a touch sensor will tell you when it's in contact with something, as the name would imply. And typically, touch sensors have a little probe. Uh, and that will, essentially, on uh, the back end, there's a switch. And when the probe is compressed, the switch is going to be closed. Now, touch sensors can work well because uh, they're very repeatable. Uh, you know, whenever there's contact, you're always going to be closing that switch. And so uh, they can be really predictable. The problem is, is that for uh, our method, you know, a touch sensor isn't 
isn't exactly what we want, right? So if you watch the CEO Hyperloop brainstorming video, you'll remember that the reason that we're trying to uh, do this ranging is because we want a way of determining uh, which goal zone during the autonomous period is active without having to do image recognition. So from the game, uh, you can determine which goal zone is active based on how many of the rings are uh, at that little dot in front of where you start. So if there's zero rings there, then the A zone is active. If there's one ring, the B zone is active. And if there's four rings, the C zone is active. And so we can determine how many rings there are based on how, how tall this stack of rings is. So with a touch sensor, what we could do, if we only had one touch sensor, we could drive up over this pile of rings and drive a touch sensor down until it contacted something. Of course, then we would also have to measure the displacement of our touch sensor. Um, because if it traveled, say, 10 centimeters, that might be it touching the ground. But if it only traveled three centimeters, then that would be a four stack. Um, just as example numbers. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way of doing that. You could do it with a motor and an encoder, but uh, we're kind of limited on motors and encoders just because we're only using the base go build a kit of parts. So we didn't really want to do that. Another option that you could do is instead of driving over the top of the uh, pile of rings, you could come at it from the side, and essentially then you would use two touch sensors, both at different heights. So you would have one at the height of a single, of a single ring, and if that was contacted, you'd know that there's either one ring or four rings there, and you'd have another one at the height of four rings, and if that was contacted, you would know that there's four rings. Um, that could work. That could work uh, just fine. But we wanted to look into another method of, uh, you know, quote unquote ranging. This is, I guess, more sort of pseudo ranging because we're not really getting a range to things necessarily. Um, and instead, you know, this, you know, we're kind of physically probing the uh, stack of rings. Um, so we have to come into contact with it. Uh, th that obviously introduces a level of unpredictability. And so what we wanted to do is do something that was more, a little bit more remote um, that didn't involve contacting the rings. So we kept looking through our sensors list uh, in our kit and we found that we had a bunch of color sensors. So with the color sensors, we can stack them up. So there's, we'll do a side view here. Here's one ring, all the way up to four. And if this is the side of our robot, if we put if we put a color sensor right here at the height of one ring, and we put another color sensor up here at the height of four rings, um, if we saw, since the rings are all orange, if we saw something orange in our color sensor when we drove up in front of the rings, we would know that uh, there's a ring there. So essentially, we can do all of our um, determination of which uh, autonomous zone is active using really basic logic commands. Uh, we don't have to do any kind of TensorFlow or machine learning or any kind of computer vision. Basically, what we can say is if we call this our lower sensor and this our upper, well, if lower was zero, then obviously there's nothing there. So we know that uh, we know we're in the A configuration. Now, if lower is one, so if we see one there, um, and upper 
is zero, then we know that we see something here, but we don't see anything up here. So obviously then we're in configuration B. And finally, if it's any other configuration, obviously we know we're in C, but um, to be thorough, if lower was one and upper was one, then obviously we're in configuration C. So that's the method that we're gonna use. Um, we're gonna use two color sensors to sort of act as a pseudo ranging measurement. Um, and that's gonna help us determine whether uh, zone A, B, or C is active during the autonomous period, which is gonna let us move the wobbling goal into the correct zone autonomously. Did I miss anything, Dan? You're good, Cole. Awesome, well, uh, that's gonna be it for this uh, short video on ranging methods. Uh, make sure to tune into the First Updates Now YouTube channel to continue seeing the content that comes out of the FDC University Challenge. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Thanks to Rev Robotics and GoBuilda for supplying components and providing on-stream giveaways.